past year. Um, I was down for the net banquet back in May. That's kind of my first little intro. I was at Lane and Catholic High School that same day. It was, like, it was actually a stupid day for me, and I did it to myself. But I started the day at Lehman, and then I met up with someone for coffee at Dayton, and then I went to get a talk in Cincinnati. And by the end of it, I slept. It's not like, <laughs> it's not like this is the desert, right? And it's been four days. He was hungry. Like, yeah. Yeah, right. Um, so it was great to be back. I have a few connections. We have a couple sisters in our community that are from the area, actually from sort of this area-ish. Uh, one's from Sydney, and one's from Troy. So, And then one's also from Cincinnati, so St. Archdiocese. They're on the poster. You know the poster I'm talking about, all the floating heads of sisters and priests and stuff, they're on there. Um, and yeah, Franciscan Sisters of the Martyr St. George is a big, long, drawn-out name, but the product is Franciscan, the brand is of the Martyr St. George. So that's kind of an easy way to look at it. Uh, we're obviously a Franciscan community that follows the life and spirituality of Francis. So humility, poverty, perfect joy, the curved across the Eucharist, getting a little bit messy, uh, that's what Jesus does. Most people boil down Franciscan spirituality to tree hugging and pet blessings and hippies and stuff like that, but it's not that. Um, and then we were founded in Germany in 1869 by a woman named Mother Anselma Bach, and she desired actually that we would have our greatest devotion be to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And so as she was forming our community, she went to Rome, the, whatever office is in charge of all that, and figuring out what the name of your community is going to be. And she asked that we would be the Franciscan Sisters of the Sacred Heart. But apparently someone beat us to that name. So they said, well, why don't you the name of the church you come from, which was St. George. So that's how George became part of our name. The uh, good old dragon slayer, for those of you who are Boy Scouts or soldiers, he's your guy. Uh, and But Francis was a soldier, so he would have had a devotion to St. George. And also he was baptized in the church of St. George. So it's not as random as a connection as you might think. Uh, and today, certainly, there are plenty of dragons to slay, whether it be our, the dragons in our own hearts or the dragons in our culture that need uh, the truth, beauty, and goodness, especially of the simplicity and humility of Francis to, to shine through. So grateful to have the opportunity to come and be with you tonight. Now, full disclosure, I am a vocation director, which makes people freak out and get up and run away. So if you need to do that, go ahead. Um, but I also want you to know that my greatest joy as a vocation director is when I can play matchmaker. <laughs> I actually did it last week, and it was really cool, and I hope it works out, and if it works out, it would be like my first success story. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, my greatest joy is just accompanying young people and discerning God's will and listening to the voice of God, uh, because I wish that I had had someone with me to kind of just help me learn, like, what does this voice even sound like? But I, I kind of figured it out. It took me a while, um, and, and thanks be to God, our vocation director certainly was not a pressure-filled kind of woman at all. Um, but I find that sometimes vocation directors get a bad rap because of the few that maybe are a little bit more pressure oriented. And like, if you don't do this, you're going to destroy your life. Like, that's terrible. And I'm sorry if that's ever been said to you, or if you know anyone that that's happened to, have them call me. I do lots of cleanup jobs. So, um, I want to speak to you tonight about Advent as a season of uh, kind of a posture for Advent that is to stop, to look, and to listen. And in presenting this, it's an opportunity to give you some tools of living discernment as a way of life. Because I think that's the other thing that we get wrong when we talk about discernment. A lot of people hear discernment and they go, discernment, vocation. But discernment is not like just beeline to vocation. Discernment is actually a way of life in which we live, and we learn to live with the Lord so that we can listen with the Lord and we can move with him. Uh, a lot of people will wait until they figure, like, they've got everything figured out, the I's are dotted, the T's are crossed, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt this is what I'm supposed to do before they'll ever make a move. And I had this experience today uh, that is, like, very much not a salvation issue sort of deal, but I, I noticed in myself even a hesitation to make a decision until I had all the facts and had it all figured out. Because here's what, ha what, what happened to me, is that I was flying into Dayton, and my flight was scheduled to arrive at 10.30, and I needed to rent a car, and I needed to somehow get to Mass. And so there was a mass at 11 o'clock, a mile and a half away from the airport. And so if everything went as planned, in theory, I should be able to get off the plane, I didn't check a bag, so get off the plane, get the car, and get to that parish for the 11 o'clock mass. Wouldn't you know it, flip in Chicago. <laughs> I got delayed, and we didn't land until 1046. And I thought, even if I run fast, I'm still slow. So I got to the, the rental car, and they were they were actually pretty on it. There was nobody else in line. I like went right to the counter. I got the keys. Then I had to do the walk around. And my dad always told me to do a very thorough job on the walk around when you rent a car because if there's any little nick, they're gonna charge you for it. So I put down every little smudge, like I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and I got in the car. It was 11:03, and I was like, well, so much for the parish. It's a mile and a half away. So then I was like, now I have lots of options. Thank you, MassTimes.org. <laughs> and there were all these options. Like there was two 11:30s that were in about 10 mile radius. There were like four or five noons that were in a 10 mile radius. I could have gone to Mass in Spanish or in Ghanaian, 
I don't even know what that would have been like, probably cool. Um, and then I also had a priest friend that said if all else failed, he was willing to celebrate a private mass for me because he didn't want me to be a pagan, which I very much appreciate. <laughs> and I found myself paralyzed by the options. I found myself paralyzed because there were too many options. And I was like, I don't know this diocese very well. Like, what if I go to a parish and the mass is not listen? I mean, it'll still be valid, probably, but probably maybe not listen. What if the music's terrible? What if the homily's bad? What if hey, all the different things? Like, I wanted to make it perfect. And then I realized, you know what? I just need to go meet Jesus somewhere. And it actually doesn't matter where I end up. Because he is going to show up wherever I go. And the encounters that I'm going to have are going to happen because he's arranging them wherever I end up. And so I think, first and foremost, to live a posture of discernment is to just go. To go and to trust that like, there's something you actually can't go wrong with. And that if you go with Jesus and invite him to go with you, you can't go wrong. Period. And if you do make a step that's not quite the right step, if you're with him, it's going to re redirect you real fast. It's kind of like if you, if you go canoeing or kayaking, right? You cannot turn a canoe or kayak around from a stationary position. You've got to be moving in a particular direction. And only when you're moving in a particular direction can you stick your paddle or your oar in and reorient. It's the same thing in discernment, in living the discerning life. Living the discerning life is a constant, constant process of learning the voice of Jesus and walking and moving in the Holy Spirit. We will never be fully there until we're living in the presence of Jesus and in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in the heavenly courts. But on this side of heaven, we actually can get to a place where we know what it sounds like to some degree. And the first step to doing any of that is to stop, to just pause. Now, as 21st century Americans, we have a hard time stopping. We gotta go, we gotta have all these gadgets so that we can multitask, which oftentimes when I find myself multitasking, I find myself no tasking at all. Uh, to stop. And Advent, one of the words that we hear frequently throughout the scriptures, especially in the, in the prophet Isaiah, but really just throughout, is this word behold. What does the word mean to behold? When I behold something, uh, it actually stops me in my tracks to some degree. I took Latin for four semesters in college. I did very poorly, but I got enough. And one of the things that I did learn was my Latin professor said the word ecce, whenever you see the word ecce in scripture, it means literally, whoa, check this out. <laughs> so whenever I hear the word behold or ecce, I always am like, whoa, check this out. But the ecce is there to stop us in our tracks and to pull us into a sense of beholding, a sacred pause, if you will. A couple years ago, I read this book called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And it was written by a Protestant pastor who basically just posits that we are too much in a hurry, and because we're so much in a hurry, we miss so much. Like in the effort to like make sure we don't miss a thing, we actually miss a whole lot. And so even coming, coming here tonight is just a pause. It's a sacred pause. The Sabbath is a sacred pause in the going and the moving and the, the constant, everything that we're doing. So the question to ask yourself with the running is, from what am I running and why am I running? And to ask yourself both of those questions, maybe not even ask yourself those questions, but to bring those into a conversation with the Lord Jesus, what am I running from all the time? Or why am I running all the time? I mentioned back when I was here in May, I kind of did that day to myself. when I, I ran from Lambing Catholic High School to meet with someone and have coffee. And I, I did that to myself. And I realized, actually, as I was driving home the next day, and I had, you know, six hours in the car by myself, be like, oh, why am I so exhausted? Oh, because I did that to myself yesterday. And I didn't give myself enough space. And in fact, I, I was staying with a host family down in Cincinnati to speak at the net banquet. And my plan was I was going to get to their house, and I was going to shower and change into my fancy habit. And, uh, and I arrived, and the couple said, okay, we're going to be leaving in about 20 minutes. Oh, okay, do you have an iron? Because my fancy habit's a little wrinkled from the car ride. <laughs> so I an iron in that. And then they were like, yeah, we have to meet with the benefactor at the, at the venue. Um, so you can just you know, visit with everybody. And I was like, actually, can I have your car keys? Can I just stay in your car? And I literally sat in the back seat of their car for a half an hour just so that I could have 30 minutes of solitude before I had to go beyond with a bunch of people again. So that pause, that pause is so, so important. Because what happens in that pause is it opens us to receive. One of my favorite Advent books of all time, if you've never read it, I highly, highly recommend it. It's called The Read of God 
It's by Carol Hauslander. And it likens the Blessed Mother to being a reed, R-E-E-D, over which the breath of God, the Holy Spirit, breathes, and a beautiful song is made. And why is the song made as the breath goes over the reed? It's because of the openness. It's because of the capacity that the Blessed Mother has. Another great image of capacity, uh, it was St. Angela of Foligno, a Franciscan mystic, and Jesus in, her, in his revelations to her said, if you make yourself a capacity, I will make myself a torrent. If you make yourself a capacity, I will make myself a torrent. And so when we stop and we open ourselves, we begin to live the most fruitful human activity, which is receptivity. Receptivity is the most fruitful human activity. Uh, John, Jean Corbon, who is a, a bishop who wrote the last pillar of the catechism, also wrote a beautiful reflection on prayer and liturgy called The Wellspring of Worship. And it, that, that's where that quote comes from. The receptivity is the most fruitful human activity. That is as fruitful as we think we can be in our, um, our excessive movement and flittering about here and there and the doing and the performing. Actually, it's more fruitful for us to just open ourselves to receive. Because that's the space where we can lose, a lose the distraction, where we can lose the escapism. And there's no room for running when we open ourselves to receive. There's just this like very vulnerable posture, vulnerable position. Even just to hold our hands open, like, whew, what is it like? I can't fight if my hands are down. I can't resist if my hands are down and open. All too often, I'm like the little kid who's like running and the parent has to come and like scoop, up, scoop me up so that I don't run too far away. Uh, and then I kick and I scream until I fall asleep. <laughs> and that's, that's like really what I need to receive, is that gift of rest. Um, you, might, you might be familiar with the quote by Father Pedro Arupe, who was the Superior General of the Society of Jesus and the Jesuits for a number of years. And he was giving a talk to young adults about prayer. And he spoke about prayer really very beautifully. And at the end, um, this young man raised his hand and said, well, you, you talk a lot about prayer, but you haven't really taught us anything practical. And Father Arupe responded by saying, nothing is more practical than falling in love and doing so in a very concrete way. And he goes on to like, what you, what you are in love with will decide what you do with your days. What you, what you are in love with will decide what you watch and what you read and um, who you spend time with. And then he ends with this like G money quote that looks beautiful on a canvas and is a great wedding gift. Fall in love, stay in love, it will decide everything. The stopping is to allow yourself to fall in love. What does it feel like to fall in love? I've heard someone say, it kind of feels a little bit like falling down the stairs sometimes. <laughs> right? There's a sense of like, ugh, I'm just completely and utterly stopped because I have been so completely and utterly moved. And so the first step to having a fruitful advent, to living this posture of advent of stopping and looking and listening is to stop and to live with that capacity and to make yourself available to what God wants to do. And again, this, this is a posture of advent that actually teaches us how to live for the rest of the year and the rest of our lives because our entire life is a continual advent until the second coming of Jesus or until our own experience of his coming. So stop. The second movement is to look. What causes your blindness? What prevents you from being able to see? What prevents you from being able to see who you are? What prevents you from being able to see who God really is? You want to pray a dangerous prayer? Pray this prayer. Lord, show me who you really are, not who I think you are. Get ready. <laughs> it's going to wreck some perceptions. And what happens when you allow him to answer that question about himself is he actually begins to answer that question for you as well. And you start to see much more clearly who you really are and not who you think you are. And he moves you into this position of deeper self-knowledge, yes, but not just deeper self-knowledge, a deeper self-possession, a deeper receptivity of the gift that you are, a deeper acceptance of the gift that you are, and yes, even a deeper acceptance of your weaknesses. Because it's only when you know who you are and you accept and possess who you are that you're capable of making a gift of yourself in whatever vocation it is you're called to. So what prevents you from seeing God as he is, from seeing yourself as you are, what makes you blind? What makes you blind to recognizing the movements of the Lord in the course of your story? So to, to look is to live a renewed attentiveness. This is the be ready of Advent, right? Stay awake, be ready. Like you, gotta, you gotta do it because we need to have this new, renewed attentiveness to every little movement. Any athletes in the room? Okay, any athletes that are good enough
enough to watch film. I mean, I was an athlete, but not good enough to watch film. Plus, I played tennis. So there's not a whole lot of film you can watch <laughs> tennis. But why do you watch film? You watch film to see your strengths and your weaknesses, and also your opponent's strengths and weaknesses. Well, there's a way that we actually can watch film in the spiritual life, and that's called the exam. Some of you might be familiar with the exam and the practice that is, again, popularized within Ignatian spirituality. It's a popular thing to do. Uh, we hear the word examine, and we probably think right away like sin, confession, examination of conscience. Got to go, right? Examine is a little bit more than that. It's a little bit deeper than that. It's not just looking at what have I done wrong, but it's also looking at what have I done well. And it's less about the right and the wrong, and a lot more of the where have I seen and experienced God's love for me, and how have I responded to that? How have I been faithful to those movements? How have I stubbornly rejected those movements? Where did I resist his grace and love? Where did I lean into his grace and love? There's lots of different ways of doing the exam. I hesitate to, to offer specific formulas for it, um, because it's not as much about formula as it is about relationship. To look is to allow yourself to live a renewed attentiveness to your relationship with the Lord. If I were to go to, to, to go to God and ask him to tell me everything that he knows about one of you, based solely on what you told him expressly in prayer, how much would he be able to say? Does he know your favorite color? Does he know your favorite blizzard in Dairy Queen? Does he know how you drink your coffee in the morning? Does he know uh, the gift that, if, he, if you opened up this package right now and you got this gift, like what would make you the most excited? Does he know those little things about you? Because if they matter to you, they matter to him. And I think sometimes we live this, this kind of illusion that little things don't matter to God. But if little things didn't matter to God, he wouldn't have become little. Because of the incarnation, nothing again will ever be casual or small. Because he made himself casual and small. And he enters into that reality. And he wants to enter into that reality with each of us. And to live a kind of intimacy where those little details are a part of the relationship. One of the little details that's a part of my relationship with the Lord is that I am a geography geek, and I love maps, and I love license plates. And I love when I travel, and I see license plates from exotic places, and like, that you just don't expect. And I, like, I, was in, uh, I was in North County, St. Louis. I was driving to Spiritual Direction in South County, St. Louis. And I saw a car with a Hawaii license plate. Now, how I got to St. Louis, Missouri, I don't know. <laughs> but let me tell you that that moment, it was, just like, it was like Jesus just winking at me, like, there you go. I know you're about to have a tough combo, and I just want you to know I'm with you. And as I kind of like just meditated on why is that such a big deal, like why does that excite me so much, and why does it bring me so much joy, I realized because when I was growing up, my family went on a road trip. I grew up in Rhode Island, and we drove everywhere. I, I flew on a plane once when I was in high school, and that was when I went on a youth group trip to National Catholic Youth Conference, and I was a junior in high school. And other than that, my family always drove. And my mom would give us all a piece of paper, and whoever saw the most stage won. And there was never a prize, but it was just a thing. And I realized that what my mom did in that, yeah, she was probably just trying to keep us from killing each other. <laughs> but at the same time, she actually taught me how to be attentive to little things. And although I grew up in a Catholic family that went to Mass on Sundays, we were not a super uber Catholic family that prayed the rosary together or prayed before meals unless my grandparents were around. But like, there was something about that that it wasn't explicitly Catholic, but in teaching me how to pay attention to something little, it has benefited my spiritual life more than my mom probably ever would have imagined or intended. Learn how to pay attention to the little things. Learn how to pay attention to the little things with the Lord to live that renewed attentiveness. To be sober and alert, right? As we heard in the, in the readings last week, in the liturgy hours, every Sunday we hear, be sober and alert. Like, do not grow drowsy from your carousing and drunkenness. But live that sobriety and an alertness to the work that's happening in you. Um, so just an invitation to, to pray about, where have I seen how the Father gives me good gifts? Where have I seen that the Father gives me good gifts? Because I think what happens a lot of times we get caught in the and the, we can't see the forest through the trees in, in discernment because we're so focused on like the figuring something out that we miss all the things that are happening and are being given to us in, in between. Um, I was talking to a young woman this week. She's a missionary through Life Team Missions that I got to know, and she was just sharing with me some of her discernment struggles, and she said, I just, I'm resisting so much the fact that I, like, I feel like God's been calling me to religious life for a long time, and I don't want it. <laughs> She's like, I just want to go on a date. I'm like, great, tell Jesus that. 
But she went on a retreat last week, and she had this movement of prayer where she recognized that our vocation is a gift. Why would God want to give us a bad gift? And if God wants to give her the gift of being his bride, then why would she want to refuse that? Because the father is good, and he gives good gifts to his children. He's not a father who gives snakes for loaves of bread. Is that the line? I don't know. Whatever that line is, creeps me out because I hate snakes. And I was like, <laughs> God, please don't give me a snake. This is why that whole prayer that I said at the beginning of this section of, look, show me who you really are, not who I think you are, is so important. Because it reorients our vision, and it helps us to be able to recognize his goodness, and it helps us to live that second movement of the Arupe quote, fall in love, stay in love. What are the things that take me out of love? What are the things that shape my trust in who God is? What are the things that, that kind of move me out of that space of being able to receive his love or seeing his goodness? I think one of the primary ways to do this is by living what the Israelites so often did, and that's remembrance. And the word remember is actually really important in Catholic theology. Can we go to Mass when Jesus, when, when the priest says, in persona Christi, do this in memory of me? That idea of memory, it's not just like, oh yeah, that was really cool that one time Jesus gave us his body and blood, but like the memory. When we remember that in that moment, it actually is made present again. And for the Israelites, that's what happened. When they're praying the Psalms, remember the Lord, the work the Lord, the wonders the Lord has done. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Who led us out of the Red Sea, for his mercy endures forever. And who you know, drowned Pharaoh's armies, for his mercy endures forever. Who defeated our enemies, for his mercy endures forever. That remembrance is making all those things present again. Pay attention the next time you go to a wedding. And the nuptial blessing is prayed over the couple. In that, the entire all of salvation history about marriage is prayed in that prayer. And that is like stirring up all of the graces of the way that God has prepared his people and to give the sacrament of marriage so that those graces can be released upon that couple. Same thing you go to ordination of a priest. There's this prayer of consecration that the bishop prays after he lays hands and all of the priests that are present lay hands on the newly ordained. And he stands over them and he prays this prayer and he goes through all of salvation history of all of the priesthood and all of the Old Testament leading up to Jesus and the apostles. And that's so that all of those graces can be remembered and stirred up and poured out. Israel didn't have a faithfulness, faithlessness and an infidelity problem as much as they had a forgetfulness problem. So many of their problems could be boiled down to the fact that they just forgot who they were, they forgot who God was, they forgot that he was faithful and they forgot his goodness. To be able to open up our eyes to look and to see reality and to live in reality will help us to stay in love. And then that moves us to listening. Stop, look, and listen. You all know what you get when you rearrange the, words of the, the letters of the word listen, right? Get another word. Silent. We do not have enough silence in our lives today. Guilty as charged. So guilty. There are so often when I get into a car and I'm like, okay, music. Podcast. I'm a, I'm a big podcast girl. Like, I'm a couple hundred days behind of Father Mike Schmidt's by one. <laughs> you know, but you really can't listen to that one on double time because it's already fast. And you're like, I don't, I don't know. Um, yeah, so even if it's good things, even if it's good noise, so to speak, it's still noise. Even if it's, if it's a venue through which God definitely speaks to me through Bible and Year podcast or through the other podcasts I listen to or, or through some of the music that I listen to. But am I, am I quiet enough and still enough to actually hear his voice? Or is the music, or even the podcast, or even the, the very word of God, the scripture, is that just a distraction for me? Is there something in me that's uncomfortable with being alone? Is there something in me that's uncomfortable than to just open up myself to receive what he has? Listening demands a level of silence, but I think the two questions we have to ask here that prevent us from entering into an authentic listening is, what do I not want to hear? What do I not want to hear? What prevents me from listening? What do I not want to hear? I remember being a senior at Franciscan University back in the single digit 2000s, and uh, our sisters were on campus. They studied there and taught there, and I was not discerning at the time. I had a boyfriend. I very much had a boyfriend who was like, stay away from me, sisters. Do not recruit me. Thank you very much. Uh, and they were like, hey, would you play the guitar for the discernment holy hour? I was like, well, I'll play the, I'll play the guitar, but I'm not discerning. Like, just, just to be clear. <laughs> so I literally would go, and I'd like play the opening song, maybe a couple songs at the beginning. And I'd put my guitar aside, and I would just sit in the back of the chapel like this. Like, not, again, like, kind of like, not say out loud, but interiorly, just be like, I'm not listening. I'm not praying right now. I'm not praying right now, because if I'm quiet enough, and I pray right now, you might tell me something I don't want to hear, so I'm just not going to pray. 
that's the equivalent of like a little kid with those earmuffs. Like, I'm, if I if I can't hear you, you don't exist, right? Like, if I'm, if I'm covering my eyes, you can't see me. It's completely an illusion. We make ourselves deaf so often out of fear. So we don't listen. We're not able to listen because of that deafness, because of the distractions we have in our lives. Even if they're good distractions, like I mentioned, or perhaps because of a distance. Perhaps it's just been a while since we've really allowed ourselves to enter into prayer. And so there's something kind of uncomfortable about sitting in the silence with the Lord. There's something uncomfortable about spending time with Him in prayer. And rather than lean into the discomfort, rather than try to take a step toward Him so that we can kind of bridge the gap of that distance, all too often we take a step backwards and further away. And then we end up in the illusion of desolation or self-induced desolation. I talk to a lot of young adults who are just like, yeah, I'm just in desolation right now. Like, tell me about that. I'm just not really praying. Well, that's why you're in desolation. Like, <laughs> hello. Don't blame this on God. <laughs> like, take a step. Take a step forward. The other thing that happens sometimes with that distance is that we become desensitized to the voice of God. We become desensitized to the ways that he wants to speak to us. So again, taking a step forward and taking a step into that gap that perhaps has been created for our, for our own sinfulness or our own lack of discipline in prayer is to allow ourselves to become resensitized to the voice of God. And knowing what his voice sounds like takes practice. Um, I don't know all of you well enough, but I don't, and I don't know how well you all know each other, but I would suspect that you know each other to some degree, varying degrees within this room. If I were to take one of you and blindfold you and have you stand in the front of the room and then point to other people and have them call your name, do you think you'd be able to identify their voices? Like who it was that was calling your name? Maybe. Maybe 50%, somewhat. Well, who, who would it be easy to know? The people you spend time with. The people that are in your closer inner circle. The people who show up every single time you have this. Because we know the voices of the people we spend time with. So if you want to know what the voice of God sounds like, spend time with it. If you want to know what the voice of God sounds like, read the scriptures and pay attention to what has your attention and start to find the patterns. If you want to know what the voice of God sounds like, pay attention to what happens in your heart when the gospel is proclaimed at Mass. Are there words or phrases that are kind of patterned, that are just like, yep, there words like, oh, there's that word again. I'm a water girl. I grew up in Rhode Island. I just love water. So anytime there's anything about water in the scriptures, I'm like, yes, that's it. It's right there. During Advent, my word has been mountain. I'm just like really aware of the, the way that God uses mountains in salvation history. And in the language of liturgy, the language of the, the opening prayers of Mass, or uh, in the language of the, of the readings, especially in the Old Testament, there's this image of the mountains of God. Like what happens on the mountain? And, the, and on the mountain, the Lord will provide, the Lord of hosts will provide for his people, and yeah, just all those, all those images. So paying attention to those kind of patterns, those kinds of things that might have your attention. Like, as even going beyond voices, if you're lying in your bed at night at home and someone walks down the hall, you probably can tell who it is without getting up and going to check. I hope. If you can't, you should want to call the cops. But like, <laughs> we even know the footsteps of the people that we live with. Right? There's something like when we live in intimacy with people, we even know their movements. I can be in the chapel and not turn around when I hear someone coming in at 5.04 for 505 morning prayer. I know exactly who it is, Sister Antonia. I know what her footsteps <laughs> sound like. I know what her shoes sound like. We've lived together for a long time. And I know that she always comes in at 5.04 for 505 morning prayer. So we know the movements. I did that activity once, actually, uh, in a high school classroom with a group of students, and I had a student who his mom taught in the school. And we kind of arranged it ahead of time, and I blindfolded him and had him in the front of the class, and I had the door propped open, so he didn't even hear the door open. And I just had her go and stand right next to him and not say anything. She was within, like, touching distance. I mean, he could, like, touch her shoulder pretty easily. And I said, Blake, there's someone standing next to you right now. Can you tell me who it is? And he just goes, yeah, it's my mom. Not missing a beat. I said, how did you know that? He said, I could smell it. <laughs> right? There's something that like, when we open up our sense, like, the listening that we're invited to to grow in relationship with the Lord is not just the listening with our ears, because God doesn't sound like Morgan for you when he speaks to me. I wish he did. It would be a lot easier that way. But to open up all of our senses, to allow the looking and the listening to involve not just our eyes, not just our physical senses, but, but the senses of our heart, but also to allow our physical senses to be in union with senses of our heart. There's a uh, priest gave a talk one time, it, it was called um, Garlic, Parsley, and Mom. <laughs> and he was talking about how whenever he smells garlic and parsley on his hands, it makes him think of his mom. And the way that her hands always smelled like garlic and parsley. 
And then the smelling of garlic and parsley on his hands that makes him think of his mom leads him to a place where he actually thinks of like how, what was his mom doing when she smelled like garlic and parsley? She was cooking and providing and preparing this meal to nourish him as her son. And so then that led him to a place where he was able to just kind of connect that to the Lord and the way that he nourishes and provides and is, is like so intentional about creating this, this gift for his son. So then when he would smell garlic and parsley on his hands, he wouldn't just think of his mom, but it, was, it jumped to the father. And so these very natural things, and St. Therese has lots of things like that, but she's my friend of me, Saint, so I try not to talk about her too much. Um, but like where, where she would see this very natural thing in creation, and it would lead her to this crazy contemplation on the 14th mansion or whatever, but like because she was able to make that connection. Because the things that she experienced so often in the tangible, concrete, everyday reality in entering into the silence, the Lord was able to speak and draw those connections and move her heart and draw it closer to him. This is what obedience is ultimately all about. The word obedience comes from the Latin ab audire, which means to listen. To listen. If we can't listen, we can't be obedient. And in order to be obedient, we have to move into that listening to recognize that obedience is not blind. Like I take a vow of obedience. That's not just like this blind, like, I will do whatever you want me to do because I have taken a vow of obedience. That's robotic. Obedience comes from listening, not roboticism. Obedience comes because I've heard the voice of God and I've heard it proclaimed to me and declared to me and made known to me in a very concrete reality of my religious superior. And so then I can say yes to that. Obedience is always free. Robots aren't free. There's nothing free about that. So when we fall in love and we stay in love, it will indeed decide everything. It's okay to let it decide everything, because God's love is personal and it is trustworthy. There's a lot of lies that swirl that make us think it's not personal, that maybe makes us feel like a robot sometimes, that maybe our false sense of who he is or our false sense of obedience could keep us in a victim identity or could keep us stuck in our heads. I don't know about you, I get stuck in my head a lot. And then I just find myself in this like melancholic vortex of doom that leads me to a giant black hole of suckage, and it's just like, how do you get out of that? get out of that by saying, Jesus, keep me out of my head and in your heart. Because it's the only safe place to be. Because he's a personal God. And he's trustworthy. And he wants to have me find a spot in his heart to just nestle up, to let all the things that I think are really important actually fizzle away. Because he's the one thing. Because falling in love and staying in love, he then gets to decide everything. And his trustworthiness we need to like, allow him to prove his trustworthiness in some sense to us because we don't like to believe it right off. And the only way that we can actually allow him to prove his trustworthiness is for us to take risks. It's in the risk-taking that our hearts are expanded. And this goes back to capacity, back to the stopping, and back to allowing others to receive. When I take a risk, I allow my heart to be expanded. I allow my capacity to receive really some beautiful surprises of grace to be expanded. And that allows my skepticism and my hurt and my having to figure things out and my grasping to die. By stepping out in faith in the same way that Peter stepped out. Peter steps out of the boat. People give him a bad rap for starting to sink. But really, he's the only one who had the guts to even step out of the boat. I think the people who have the bad rap should be the other apostles who are too afraid to even do that. Let's not be afraid to take those risks, to stop and to look and to listen and to give God permission to show us who he is. To look at us, even. I think part of the not stopping is we're afraid of him looking at us because what might he see? Or what might his gaze do to us? His gaze might melt us. I recently heard a praise and worship song by Maverick City. It's called When I Lock Eyes With You. I've been really moved by been praying with it for the past couple weeks. It's so beautiful. And the refrain is just, when I lock eyes with you, I see my reflection. Whew. What is it like to look into the eyes of Jesus and in his eyes... To see us, to see him looking at us in his own eyes. It's intense. It's an intense gaze. Pope Benedict in his document on Hope Space Solve, he says that um, before his gaze, all falsehood melts away. All falsehood melts away. And we can allow him to see us, to show us who he is, and to speak to us in a very real way. And then when all falsehood melts away, to live in the reality the reality of his goodness, the reality of who we are, the reality of who he is, and to walk forward with great freedom and great trust. So I'm going to stop talking at you there. I have no idea how long I talked or what I just did, but I want to go ahead and open it up for questions because 
something I might have said might not have been coherent, setting up for a long time today. Um, but also, you might want further clarification or further details. Or you can just ask me random things. My favorite color is orange. Yes? You said that obedience is always free. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more on that and expand on it. Yeah, sure. So obedience is always free. God's never going to hold a gun to your head and you have to do something. Right? Jesus going to the cross, he's obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Right? We hear that in St. Paul's, but not a text of St. Paul. Jesus doesn't go to the cross like a robot. He doesn't go to the cross because the Father is dragging him there. He goes to the cross in obedience because the Father has invited him there, and he says yes to that. And so there's actually a great freedom that comes. Now, um, I had this experience recently. I'm just going to kind of, since it is being recorded, just kind of blur it a little bit. But I was asked, uh, I, there's this one person who always asks me to do a task that I despise. And I actually, the task in and of itself is something that brings me a lot of life, but it's because when she asks me to do it, it just hurts me. And so I recently was in a situation where I knew she was going to ask me to do it. And I literally turned to one of my sisters and I said, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to choose to do it before she asks me to do it. So then when she asks me to do it, I'll be like, are we done? <laughs> There's a freedom there. There's a freedom there for me because I chose it. I chose it and said, you know what, like this is an unpleasant thing when she asks me to do it. But I'm going to choose it ahead of time and I'm going to choose to say yes to it so that there's a sweetness to that gift. Um, if I choose to say yes to what I do not know, there's a sweetness to that gift. And yeah, it might not be what I would choose for myself. Like, I never would have chosen for myself to teach high school for seven years of my life. I never would have chosen that for myself at all, especially in New Jersey for four of those years. Not what I would have picked. But I was asked to do it in obedience, and I went, and there was a great gift that was there for me. But I could have said no. It would have made mother's job more difficult. The people please around me wouldn't have wanted that piece. <laughs> but when we step out with Jesus in obedience to the Father's will, there will always be a great sweetness. Is that helpful? Yeah, thank you. I hear that a lot. Like there's like focus missionaries that I work with, or, or life team missionaries who like live a rule of life, or like they have certain things that are expected of them because of their work that they do. And like teaching them how to like say yes to something before they're even asked to do it, so that there can be that more uh, um, more of a surrender in it. Anything else? Yes, sir. Uh, sister, where's your community located? Sure, I live in Alton, Illinois. Uh, yeah, just over the river from St. Louis, about 25 minutes from St. Louis Airport. It's in the Springfield, Illinois diocese. We have about 55 sisters who live there at the provincial house, and then we have about 10 other houses, mostly in the Midwest. Oh. A lot in Illinois. We do whatever, like, mother and son would do whatever the church needed, and so we do whatever the church needs, literally. About 40% of our sisters are in some kind of health care. That's everything from direct nursing to health care administration to uh, kind of allied health fields. And then in the education realm, everything from daycare center to starting six weeks old to teaching in college level. Um, so originally you were against like the idea of becoming a sister. Kind of how how did you make that change? My heart grew three sizes that day. But no, but in a very real way, um, I went to Princeton University. The idea of being a sister had come to mind when I was growing up. I was really involved in youth group. I was really involved in you know youth ministry and things like that in my diocese. My friends would always tease me. I was in public school. And they said, you're going to be a nun who wears tennis shoes and drives a, drives a van and we see a passenger van and plays a guitar and teaches drama at a Catholic high school. That's kind of like the profile that they had come up with for me. And I hated it. And I hated it because the only sisters that I knew growing up were old and angry. And so the first sisters that I met that were not old and angry were when I went to school at Franciscan. But um, I was also pretty obsessed with cute Catholic boys and just thought I will marry one of them. And we could have 12 children and they can all be priests and sisters and this idea will go away. Uh, dated a couple of them. One of them was everything I could possibly imagine of like the perfect husband and father. He had all the qualities. And he was from Tennessee, and when I graduated, I took a job down there. So like literally, two weeks after graduation, moved to Tennessee, interviewed for the job, was offered the job within an hour of being there, and then dream boyfriend drove up two and a half hours from Memphis basically to profess his love for me. Okay, great weekend, let me just tell you. <laughs> and then three months later, he broke up with me. I was like, okay. 
hey, now I live halfway across the country from my family and my friends in my comfort zone, and what the heck, Lord? But I think in a very real way, kind of a pattern in my story is God bringing me far away from my comfort zone so that I can find a new, new kind of silence and a new kind of solitude and have to lean into him quite a bit more. And as I did a lot of leaning in in the midst of kind of being heartbroken, I was pretty upset at that break of those. It's kind of a nasty thing to do to someone, really. Um, and, and the way that it all went down and what was said was just really kind of painful. And um, in the midst of grappling with that is when I finally started to recognize the remembering, like, how has God shown me in the past how he's been faithful to me, how I've received his love? Like, recognizing the patterns of giving and receiving love in the past help you to start to see what the giving and receiving love is meant to look like in the future. And I started to, to recognize that marriage would have, in some ways, it felt too small for my heart. I felt a little bit constricted and confined by the idea of marriage, whereas when I thought about being a bride of Christ and like being able to be a mother of souls, there was something expansive that happened in my heart. So... As I kind of leaned into that, I also knew that if I were called to live this life, I was definitely called to be a Franciscan because I'm way too Franciscan to be Dominican, Carmelite, Benedictine, or anything else. So it's like, yeah, don't even need to waste my time going to check out Nashville. Dominicans are only two hours away from where I live. Uh, and within the Franciscan family, our community, the, the, char the charism that we have that we bring to the church in the world is to make Christ merciful, love visible. And we do that by gazing upon the, the pierced heart of Christ crucified and receiving that merciful love and then bringing that wherever we go. And so... Uh, I remember one of the sisters one time in class kind of threw out this line, kind of a throwaway line in class one day, just talking about her community, and she said, um, yes, we shall look upon the one whom we have pierced, just like in John's gospel. And I was like, ooh, what was that? Like, there was just something about when she said it that kind of, it arrested me in some way. It stopped me in my tracks. Um, and so then, fast forward, I'm living in Tennessee, working at Holy Cross Church. And as I was sitting in the front pew one day, late at night, just me and Jesus, looking up at this huge wooden crucifix, that line from John's Gospel just kind of bubbled up out of nowhere, but not out of nowhere, because it had been kind of like buried deep within for a long time. And I started to see, like, that's that's the shape of my heart right there. Like, I want to look at him every day of my life, and I want to bring his love to the world. So that's how it all happened. And um, just a, kind of a follow-up on, on the guy and that nasty, really awful situation. <coughs> Fast forward the way his life has unfolded since that moment. Praise God, he broke up. Thank you, Jesus, because what I experienced as rejection was actually protection. Because I would have been the woman he walked out on. I would have been the woman he walked out on. He went on to be ordained a priest, and he left the priesthood after a year. I would have been the woman he walked out on. And Jesus said, I don't want you to have to suffer that. So, pray for him a lot. Um, could you elaborate more on what you said about um, who, we, who God is and who we think he is and then who we are and who we actually are? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So often we live in these illusions. Um, I think a lot of us have a false vision of God based on our own experience of who our parents are and who our parents have been for us. So, um, like, whether it's that they've been really harsh disciplinarians and so then we kind of, like, kind of project that onto God. Um, I this, I this, this all came about actually one day when I pulled over for speeding. <laughs> yeah. Actually, not, it wasn't speeding. I got pulled over for running a stop sign. That's what it was. It was speeding came a couple months later. Um, <laughs> but I was pulled over for running a stop sign. I didn't realize I had even done it. It was 7.15 in the morning. There was nobody else around. It wasn't even at an intersection. It was just kind of this random slow down sort of stop sign. And, um, and the guy pulled me over, and I was beating myself up badly for what I, uh, for what I had done. I just thought, like, this is the end of the world. I should probably go to jail for the rest of my life. Like, it cost, cost the community all this money on such a burden to society, all these things. And um, as I arrived at my destination, it was for like an all-school mass thing. I was going to talk to all the kids at the grade school. I was sitting in the church before mass started, and I just heard the father ask me very clearly, like clear as day. I know it's the father when it's a question, and when it's direct, and when it cuts through all my crap. And he just asked me, why are you looking like I'm a cop? Like, oh, <laughs> yeah, you're right. There's so much part of my heart that, like, just is waiting for God to catch me doing just, just, just the wrong thing so he can punish me. And I didn't realize how much that image of God, uh, how much I projected that onto him, and how much I allowed that to hold me back in fear in my relationship with him. And that was the moment that gave rise to the prayer of, show me who you really are, not who I think you are. And in that, it just kind of started to peel away a lot of the illusions that I had about the harshness of God, uh, or that he's a 
miser and pulling out on me, things like that. Just to recognize, like, wherever there's fear in my heart about God and approaching him, there's probably a false image of God there. Because perfect love casts out all fear, and God is love. So pay attention to your fears. Pay attention to what you hold back when you go before him in prayer. Or what prevents you from going there. Is that helpful? Yeah. Father, we just pause in your presence and we give you permission to look at us. Help us to receive your gaze deeply within our heart so that all falsehood might melt away. Any falsehood or false understanding of who we are, any lies that we are just cogs in your wheel, we're just characters for your entertainment, those lies would, would cease and desist in your merciful gaze. That we would see ourselves as you see us. That we would hear us, hear you, hear you call us by our name. That we would hear you call us beloved. Father, we ask for the gift and the grace and the presence of your Holy Spirit to stir our hearts and to make us aware of the places where we resist you and we resist your love and the places where you're inviting us to rest in you and to rest with you. And Lord, in any places where we, instead of rather than rest, we wrestle with you, we ask for the gift of surrender. Give us a surrender that's born of a trust in your goodness, a trust in your plans, a trust in your promises, a trust in your faithfulness to your promises. Remind us that your love never fails. Remind us that even in our experiences of human love that falls short and is imperfect and fails us so often, that your love is so much greater than that. And that your love triumphs over all. Jesus, you were obedient to the will of the Father, even to the point of death, death on a cross. And so we ask for the grace to live sonship with you. To share in your relationship with the Father in a new and radical way that allows us to enter into the joy of being received and loved by him, but also the joy that comes from obedience, even when it means the cross. Blessed Mother Mary, give us the grace to listen with you, to listen like you, and to magnify God's greatness as you do. for us as your children as we turn to you together in prayer saying remember O most gracious Virgin, Virgin Mary that never, that never was it known that anyone who fled thy protection, protection and for thy help or sought thy intercession was left unaided inspired by this confidence I fly into thee Virgin of Virgins my mother to thee I come before thee I stand sinful and sorrowful O mother the word incarnate despise of my petitions then thy mercy hear and answer me. 